Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of HCAM Sports Talk Live. I'm your host, Tom Nappy. HCAM Sports Talk Live airs every Wednesday at 3 p.m. On today's edition, we'll fill you in with all you need to know about the upcoming Hopkinton Hillers fall to season. We'll replay our interview with Rich Cormier, who talks about all the details that you should know about with the upcoming fall two season. Of course, the sports that we will have this upcoming fall two season include football, uh, girls volleyball, unified basketball, and also swimming. And you can catch all the home games live on the HCAM platforms. Most games will be live on HCAM Ed and YouTube. They will all certainly be live on YouTube. Uh, there might be a couple instances where they won't be on HCAM Ed, but for the most part, you'll be able to catch them there too. And not only that, we will also have uh, freshman and JV games live this year, including football and girls volleyball. So we'll fill you in with what to expect on the HCAM channels and also some of the rule changes and differences in the fall two season. Of course, fall two season, not typically a high school sports season. It was added this year to accommodate some of the sports that weren't be able that weren't able to be played during their normal seasons. So we are certainly happy though that the athletes get an opportunity to play the, the sport that they love. But first off, let's uh, take a look at the Hopkinton Hillers fall schedules. We'll start off with what to expect this week on the HCAM channels. On Thursday, March 11th, we'll have Hiller Girls Volleyball versus Holliston. The JV2 game is at 3.30 p.m. The JV1 game at 4.45 p.m. And then Varsity at 6 p.m. And then on Monday, March 15th, we'll have the second Hillers swimming meet of the season at 7 p.m. So you'll be able to catch the swimming meet at 7 on Monday, March 15th. And other sports to be on the lookout for, freshman JV and varsity football. And again, we'll have all home football, swimming, girls volleyball, and unified basketball games throughout the fall two season. Let's take a look at the Hopkinton Hillers 2020-2021 varsity football schedule. Their first game is a scrimmage against Medway in Medway, 5 p.m. on Friday, March 12th. And then the season gets started Saturday, March 20th. They'll be at Holliston, 11 a.m. Friday, March 26th at Ashland at 6 p.m. Then Saturday, April 3rd, they'll take on Medway, uh, excuse me, Medfield at 1 p.m. And then on Friday, April 9th, they'll take on Westwood. They'll host Westwood at 7 p.m. And then Friday, April 16th, they'll host Norwood at 7 p.m. So Medfield, Westwood, Norwood are the home games. They're expected to be played on the Hopkinton High School turf. As you'll hear from Rich Cormier a bit later in the show, they may try to get on the grass field this year, but we'll have to wait and see for that. But in any case, we'll certainly have some great football coverage for you on HCAM this upcoming fall to season. And we are excited to see the football team in action. Maybe a little bit later than we're used to, but that's okay. They get to play some great opponents and there may be games added. So be on the lookout for that as the season goes on. The girls' volleyball schedule that kicks off on Tuesday, March 9th at, in Holliston. Uh, that game, of course, already happened if you're watching this show. And then on Thursday, March 11th, their first home game against Holliston, uh, which is happening later tonight. And then Tuesday, March 16th at Ashland. Thursday, March 18th, they'll host Ashland. Tuesday, March 23rd, they host Medfield. And then on the 25th, they're at Medfield. 30th, they host Westwood. April 1st, at Westwood. April 6th, they host Norwood. And then on Thursday, April 8th, at Norwood. Tuesday, April 13th, at Ashland. Of course, these times are subject to change. They're not expected to, but you never know what can happen. And also, games may be added as the season goes on, so be on the lookout for that. 
and the swimming schedule. We had our first swim meet this past Monday night. The Hopkinton Hillers home pool this year is Milford High School. And of course, uh, this year they are doing swimming individually. So the Hillers use their pool and their opponents use their pool. And then they take the times and determine the winner. And in the first meet of the season, Hillers boys and girls were able to defeat Malden and Waltham. It was a nice victory for the Hopkinton Hillers in their first meet of the year. And it was a three team meet. Malden, uh, they did their swimming at their pool, Waltham at their pool, and then they took all the times and the Hillers got the W in both meets. So they are both, the boys and the girls are two and oh on this season without further ado let's take a look at some highlights from the first swim meet of the season that was a 103b front one and a half somersault pike juliana's up next juliana's a senior this year Also performing a 103B. Now, did the divers like having the diving at the beginning? Well, yeah, I think so. I think it's nice because uh, they kind of get the jitters out right away, and then they can be there for the rest of the team afterwards. Tess is doing the same dive as Eve, 104B. Job. That's a 401C. That's an inward dive and tuck. We have Tyler Holbrow in lane three in the lead, followed closely by Mia Carboni in lane four. Oh, and uh, looks like uh, in lane two there that um, Olivia Scalara is uh, picking up on Mia Carboni, and then um, Pablo way in lane six. Actually, I think he definitely outtouched Mia. I didn't see if he outtouched um, Olivia. And and then we had Olivia Wade and Charlotte Dowd. Yeah, very good freshmen. swim. Very good swim by Tyler. I, I couldn't tell if it was, it's going to be close to a, um, it's, it's a very good time. I, I can only tell you it was in the 23s. Michelle, I'm curious if it's a lot sh uh, more shallow than Keith Tech where yeah. um, Usually, some, wow, that nice is swim cool. by Aditya. nice swim by Aditya. I wish I and had I have to say, Lucas I did is, not. Lucas, Lucas is, is coming. Yep, yep. yep. Whoa, Sophie is come on, to... Lucas, push. All okay. right, I think Sophia might have outtouched him. Sports. Now, what did you say, Sean Haley? Is it Sean? Sean Haley's a junior. He's, he, he's trying to he's, beat out. Uh, he, yeah, he's got his. He, I think eyes he's got to keep on. going. Go, go, go. And then, uh, let's see. Let's, come on, uh, Tyler. That's it. Well, Tyler, Tyler and Sean, look Sean. at that. They're neck yeah. and neck. And oh my gosh, all right, I close. got I got uh, Tyler at a 56.10. I don't know. Yep. Um, I That's a very good time. Um, I should have caught Cassie as well. So coming in here on uh, lane six, that was Katie Balster. And then we had um, Anna and then Elizabeth. Yep. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's it's a marathon. It is. It's 20 laps, so uh, you definitely it's good to come out strong, but um, you want to, you know, really kind of pace yourself and uh, so that you have that gas still in the engine at the end, so you can really go that yeah. last hundred. Yeah. Um, and this is it, right? Uh, this is it for Alyssa and for Tyler. Yep. Um, I always lose track of the lane. Then I see that red thing. There we go. Out. Oh, and I didn't stop the clock. Darn yeah. it. Nice. We'll get we have Maggie McCarthy, lane two. Um, we have Deirdre Belger, lane four, and Natalie Buffard, uh, lane five. So you're going to see some people that have swam in this pool a lot. Uh, hopefully they come through. Um, <clears throat> but we will go through it. Lane two, uh, Maggie starting off, Pablo... 
coming up second, Olivia Wade, another legacy from the Stingrays, coming up third, and Pierce Farrell, I think also a Stingray, former Stingray. Yes. In lane, uh, in, in four in lane two. Lane three, Brandon Davis Pishoff, uh, Holly Burns, and Sophia Luce. Lane four, um, Deirdre Belger, Mia Caponi, Aditya Dutta, Kevin Gu. Sorry. And lane five, we have Nina Buffard, I'm sorry, Natalie Buffard, uh, Charlotte Dowd, and Anna, Anna Scalera, Olivia Scalora. <coughs> Okay. Sorry, I keep hitting my microphone. Did you um, get the time on this one? I did not. I okay. messed it up, so I apologize. Um, yep. All right. So okay, that's so a nice uh, 50 there. That was uh, Brandon, I believe. Yep. And then, uh, right. We have Mia in oh, the water. Oh, that was Deirdre. That was Deirdre. Mia nice. in the water. Nice job, girl. All yeah. right. And we have Davis Pishov in the pool. He's All in right. the lead. Okay, and now who is uh, who's swimming? Um, he looks good. He's he does look good. Cuts through the water. Nice. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I remember him when he was so little. I can't believe he's in high school and look how tall he is now. You know, we're not getting any older. That's no, sure. we are no. not. Okay, but now this is Aditya, I believe, uh, just dove in in lane four. So let's see if he can catch. Um, it looks like he's going to make a move here. He's going to make a move gonna, on. He's uh, going to try to catch Holly, Holly. there. He's Holly catching Burns. Holly, I think. Yep, and then who's in... Um, he can Doesn't rotate he? those arms, that kid. Oh, my God. Look at that. Yeah. And then that's Ooh. Olivia Wade there. In, uh, look at Aditya. Okay. And then who's, who will be the Olivia's anchors? making it happen over here. She's in lane two, right? She is in lane two. She's doing yeah. a great job. She's doing a great job. And uh, so now we have um, Kevin Gu and Sophia Luce for the final legs in lane three and four. And in lane two, that's Pierce Farrell. And in lane nice, Pierce. And in lane five, we have Olivia Scalera. So that uh, lane five was four freshmen swimming. It's pretty impressive. So they're all new to the team. I the, don't really yeah. know. Um, I know Natalie Buffard and um, was on the stingrays. I don't know the other three girls to know their uh, previous swimming, but they're they, doing a fabulous job this meet. Yeah, I tell you, um, Pierce looked I, great there coming in there. Yeah. That's great. I'm excited that there's so many strong freshmen this year. We hope you enjoyed a look at the Hopkinton Hillers swimming highlights from their first meet of the season. Right here, you can see the other meets that they have coming up. A majority of them, they'll be at the Milford High School pool. Uh, whether it's home or away, since all the teams are competing individually, and you get a good look here at the schedule coming up. They'll take on Holliston, Ashland, Framingham, and then Holliston to finish off the season. And then Ashland on the 12th will be a dual meet. And then on the 16th, it'll be the boys only as of right now. Of course, any of that is subject to change. But right now with more about the fall two season, here is a great interview we did with Hopkinton High School Athletic Director Rich Cormier to tell you all about it. And welcome into HKM Sports Talk Live. I am your host, Tom Nappy. And joining us on the show today, we have Bob Hamilton and Mike Terosian. And we have Hopkinton High School Athletic Director Rich Cormier. Guys, how are you? Oh, great. Hi, Tom. Good. How are you guys? Good. Good. Uh, so we just got done with a successful uh, winter season, Rich. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we were able to get through it okay. The team's got some games in. Uh, just tell us overall, how did everything go? Obviously, there was a few postponements along the way, but the teams must have been happy to be out there and get some games in. Yeah, I mean, you said it well, Tom. You know, we, I'm just really glad that we, we were able to finish. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of schools were not able to have winter sports at all. Um, or they had their seasons cut short for various reasons. So, you know, we did make it to the end. Um, there was definitely some bumps uh, along the way. Um, you know, we had a period of time of about three weeks where some of our teams did not have a game, um, you know, but they, I, I, I can't tell you how impressed I am with our student athletes. I mean, it's, that's a hard time, three weeks without a game. That's a lot of practice. <laughs> Um, you know, so and in our coaching staff, keeping the, the students motivated um, and just the students themselves, keeping themselves prepared and ready to play. 
And then down the stretch, because of those postponements and makeups, we had a, you know, we had stretches of, of four or five games over a six or seven day span um, in hockey and basketball in particular. So, um, you know, we were able to get there. Uh, almost all of our teams got to 10 games, which is what we were hoping to accomplish. Um, we did have one team that was only able to get to nine, um, which was unfortunate. Um, but again, I, you know, there was definitely a lot of situations that we that we had to get through this winter, but we did. Um, and, and I think ultimately the kids who participated had a great experience, uh, certainly one they won't forget, um, you know, and uh, now we quickly turn the page right into the next season. And I do want to mention we have Kevin Stone on with us as well from the Metro West Daily News. He might jump in with a question or two. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we do have the uh, fall two season coming up next, and uh, we're going to have some March and April football and some uh, girls volleyball, also some unified basketball and swimming. Mm -hmm. uh, how did everything go planning wise for the upcoming fall two season? And uh, I understand the teams are in practice right now. Uh, how's everything going? Uh, you know, knock on wood, things are going really, really well uh, through these first few days. Um, you know, the fact that we're now in our third COVID season, uh, you know, for lack of a better way of explaining it, you know, I think we're, we're getting pretty adept at, at managing the different modifications um, that are thrown at us by the state EEA, uh, as well as the MIAA and the different modifications. And, and one of the nice things is that as we've moved through the year, there's certainly some challenges that we still have in, in the mask wearing and the distancing and some of the rules that we have to abide by. But one of the nice things has been that the rules of the games have largely started to become more traditional. Um, you know, whereas in the fall, you know, you take soccer and field hockey, for example, those sports were drastically altered uh, in terms of the rules of their games. We saw some alterations in basketball um, and hockey, but really, for the most part, the games were still the games. Um, and then now, you know, football, volleyball, uh, again, during the, the games or the matches, um, they're pretty, pretty much being played as they should be. Um, the biggest challenge for swimming and diving, um, which is another one of our fall two sports, is that those meets are being held virtually. Um, so that is a significant change, not having an opponent sort of in the lane right next to you that you're kind of competing against. Um, so that's a significant change for sure. Um, but most of our sports are starting to be played a little bit more like they should be, at least in terms of the rules. Um, again, the mask wearing and some of the bench areas and things like that are certainly still uh, very, very different. So not a whole lot of differences in uh, football at all? No. Uh, in terms of the rules of the game, you know, that, you know, it's some really minor stuff in terms of like huddles, for instance, you all have to be facing the same direction you know, instead of kind of coming together in a circle, you know, really sort of limited type things. I think the biggest change for football, honestly, is that we can't use locker rooms um, uh -huh. and just given the equipment Dude. that's involved in playing football. But in terms of when they're out there on the field playing, the, the game is going to be the game of football. Um, you know, and same with volleyball. Again, there's some, some small rules and, and this is true in football. We got to sanitize the balls and the equipment and stuff like that. But again, when a volleyball match is going on, unlike in the fall, there were some significant rule changes in the fall for those schools that played volleyball in the fall. You actually had to change the ball out every point. Wow. You also had a three foot sort of buffer at the net that you sort of couldn't cross when you were going up for a hit. Right. It um, essentially took spiking out. Exactly. Um, which is obviously a, a key part of the game. Um, right. So those, those rules have been, have been eliminated. So again, now you're going to see a more traditional game of volleyball. Again, they're not going to switch sides. I mean, there are limited, there are small changes um, where they typically change sides every, every set. That's not going to happen. Um, you know, again, so there are changes, but I would say nothing, you know, overly significant like we had in the fall. I mean, soccer and field hockey were different sports. <laughs> one of my favorite changes about the volleyball not changing every set was they used to pick up their whole bench and moved. It wasn't mm -hmm. just like in hockey or, or football or basketball, where they just change sides playing, they volleyball used to pick up their all their equipment and move it to the other bench and back because there, mm -hmm. there was plenty of time for that, and uh, so that's one of the things that I'm looking forward to. Uh, but you're also also going to see with the three foot rule for the net, you shouldn't see any net violations anymore, which was a major call, which uh, 
you still, you know, could impact a game. Well, that, so that three foot rule is gone. So you That's can gone. go up to the net now. So right. you can go, you, back. I was going to say the girls volleyball team, I think is going to be a lot happier playing this season rather than the fall with all those rule changes. And that was, uh, you know, honestly, that was our hope. You know, when we, when, when, as a league, we move volleyball and most leagues did. Now, again, some did play volleyball in the fall, um, but the overwhelming majority of the state uh, moved it. And a lot of it had to do with our gym wasn't even accessible uh, at the start of the year. There was so much stuff in our gym. It, it would have been a real challenge to have volleyball. And I know we're not alone in that. Um, but the other hope was really that we'd get to play the game more traditionally and as it was meant to be played. And I think that that has proven to be the case. That was great. Uh, so what's the situation with Hiller's football? Um, I know you've talked about perhaps using the turf field and I know locker rooms aren't allowed. And the other question, um, will there be time differences in football without uh, any locker room use, such as a shorter halftime or anything like that? So um, you are correct. We are using the turf field right now. Um, our grass fields are covered in snow. Um, you know, we were able to get our turf field cleared. Um, our maintenance uh, crew was awesome. They, you know, we brought in a company. Um, again, our turf is still under warranty. So that's something that varies from school to school. You might've seen some pictures on social media where the kids get out there with shovels and, and that's great if your turf is no longer under warranty. Um, if we did that, that would void our warranty. So um, we needed to bring in a company. Uh, they came in twice. Uh, they came in last week to clear, you know, the couple inches that we still had out there. And then uh, actually it was close to a foot. And then they came in Monday morning to clear what we got this past Friday. Um, so we have been out on the turf. Um, that's where all, we have, we're offering four levels of football right now. Um, so all of our teams are practicing out there. So we're going till about eight o'clock at night with our teams. Um, and then the whole, certainly is, is, is as we move into April and we have our last couple home games, if we can play out in David Hughes stadium, which is our typical field, it would be awesome. Um, I'm sure the, the, the guys would really like to play on their traditional field. Um, but time will tell, you know, and the weather, really the weather will determine whether or not that that's, that's going to be possible or not. Um, so for right now, we're planning to practice and play all of our football games um, on the turf. Um, Halftime is still going to exist, unlike in basketball, where it did sort of get eliminated. Um, and in hockey, we went from periods to halves. Um, football halftime is largely still remaining, um, but they, teams will have to basically just go to either end zone. Um, and so, so like they used to do in Papuana. Pretty we much. Don't have the room. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, the tough part, and it'll be tough to, to maneuver for sure, is that unfortunately, they're still going to have to remain distanced. Um, so when you're talking about 45 players, uh, which is the maximum roster that we can have, um, and about six coaches, which again is the maximum amount we're allowed under MIA rules. So you have fit up to 51 people at six feet apart. <laughs> it's a lot of space. Um, you know, so it, that's not going to be easy to do. Um, obviously, the nature of sports and half times is to come together. Um, so that's certainly going to be a logistical challenge. Um, I'd imagine, especially for the coaches so, trying to draw up plays at halftime. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th those are where the, the, I think the challenges really are, is the sideline. Again, everyone has to be six feet apart. By rule, we actually have to have a cone or some sort of marking uh, to designate. Uh, we wow. did that in the spring as well, because uh, we were required to do that in the spring. Um, you know, so you might, you know, need a substitute and that player might be 35 yards away from you <laughs> as you're trying to, <laughs> to, to get his attention to, you know, you know, to sub into the game. So, I mean, there's certainly going to be some challenges, but I, I have to say our coaches are already on top of it. Uh, we've already had conversations that they're, they're going to sort of use an assistant coach who's going to be sort of, they're going to have to go get whoever we need to, to bring to the forefront. Um, you know, and, and I think most of you know, once you start playing in football, a lot of times you, you have a certain rotations, you kind of know who's, right. who's sort of coming in and who's the next person. And we had to deal with this in hockey. Sure. You know, we can only have one line change in the bench. So they had to kind of constantly rotate through who was in the bench, who was going to be the next line uh, to jump onto the ice and so forth. So coaches are great. I mean, they're very, they're willing to do whatever it takes to get their kids an opportunity to play. So um, as much as we do need to figure some things out, I'm honestly not worried about it. We'll figure it out. We'll make sure um, that we comply with the rules, but also make sure that we're obviously giving the kids a chance to compete.
And so will they have actually, cheerleaders and fans or will it just be? Uh, so like we are offering, uh, it'll vary by, by school. Um, some, some schools are allowing cheer this season. Um, some are not. Um, there's a lot of restrictions with cheer um, as it currently constituted. So we, um, I actually met uh, with two of our returning cheerleaders, two of our seniors, um, and we talked about it. And we're going to offer cheer in the spring um, and give them a chance at a competition season. Um, so, um, so again, some schools are doing it now. We're choosing to do it in the spring. Um, part of the problem with, you know, with cheerleaders, and I don't mean this to sound negative, is as I mentioned before, you're trying to space out 51 people per team at six feet apart. And now you add in cheerleaders. It's really difficult to find the spacing, um, to, to have all of these people there. So that's, that's certainly going to be sort of school by school. Um, they're supposed to be on the end zones as well. Uh, if you do have cheer this year, they would not be on the sidelines. They'd be on the end zone. And there's a lot of restrictions on what they're allowed to even do um, during the game and during practices. You know, they're, if they practice indoors, they're not allowed to yell. I, 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 so I, there's, you know, and again, so for all of those reasons is really why we made the decision to, to move cheer to spring. I know it would be a little bit weird to, you know, a big part of cheer is cheering at, at football games, but um, we're hoping that we can give them their competition season, uh, which is what many cheerleaders really prefer. Uh, not that they don't enjoy the football games, but they they really want to do their competitions. Yeah, Rich, um, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that part up because cheerleading is is not just part of the game where they cheer in between plays. I mean, they're a, a competitive sport. They are a, a sport on its own, and they are just basically that's their night in front of a big crowd. But generally, they practice and work hard towards competitions. And, you know, the Friday night uh, games, you know, they do the push-ups on the touchdowns and they do the, the right. cheers in between and whatever. But they are a competitive sport. Right. And that's, I mean, with cheer, a lot of the, the football stuff is sort of traditional. It's not really what they, they, they do some practicing, you know, for what they're going to do at games, but the, the bulk of their practices is their competition routine um, and the choreography and, and getting ready for those competitions, as Mike said. So um, I, again, we could have probably made it work this season so they could cheer at a couple games, but then they don't get to have their competition season. So it's, you know, it's like everything else this year. It's kind of like weighing your pros and cons and trying to make the best of the situation. Um, and that's why I met with the, you know, like I said, the two cheer seniors um, to kind of get their sense as well. And, and, and everyone was in agreement that the spring made the most sense. Uh, similar to volleyball, you know, Tom, you mentioned yeah. this before, you know, we move volleyball in the hopes that it would be a better situation and it is a better situation. And we're kind of hoping the same thing happens uh, by moving chair to the spring, time will tell. Because um, the other option potentially is that even if indoor competitions are still not permitted, uh, we could potentially have outdoor competitions because the weather uh, would be a little bit nicer um, in, in, in allow something like that. Um, so, and then, Bob, I think you mentioned um, fans as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so similar to what you've seen kind of each, each season, I think school by school will determine um, what they're able to you know, logistically accommodate, um, you know, so I think you'll see most towns try to have some semblance of fans. Um, some might not just because either because their numbers are high in their community or because similar to basketball, where some gyms couldn't host fans for basketball, they are probably not going to be able to host fans for volleyball either because they're going to need to use their stands as their bench area. Um, so I think you'll still see some of those limitations from a facility standpoint. Um, you know, we're still planning to do spectators as we have uh, in the previous season. So we'll have the same setup for, for volleyball and unified basketball that we did this winter for our, for our basketball teams. Football is going to be more challenging. Um, we are still allowing two spectators per home player. So again, the TVL is not allowing visiting fans. Um, but again, thanks to you guys and, and many other local cable stations, um, you know, these games are being streamed um, so that people can see the away games. The challenge for us on the turf field when it comes to football is that you have teams on both sidelines. So whereas in the fall, you know, when we had soccer and field hockey games, we were able to have fans across the field from them, you know, spaced out, but we were able to have them right basically up close and into the, you know, on the sideline. For football, that's not going to be possible. 
So again, uh, we're still sort of working out the logistics, but most likely they're going to have to sort of be up on Hughes Stadium because again, if they stand on the fence, they won't be able to see because the players will be blocking them. <laughs> so they're probably going to have to kind of go up on sort of the track area um, up there so that they're able to see down onto the football field. Um, as you guys probably know, we don't have stands you know, in the turf field. Uh, we have, you know, a couple stands by the softball field in the, in the um, baseball field, but those would not be useful uh, for watching a, no. a football game. Um, so that is something that we will struggle with. Again, we're going to allow people to come and watch, but they really won't be able to come in the fence. And that has nothing to do with, we don't want them in the fence. There's just nowhere for them to go. Right. Um, so, um, so we got to work through some of those logistics and that's another reason why it would be great if we can play in Hughes stadium, because then we can bring fans in um, and have them, you know, we can put X's, you know, where you've seen many people do this, they'll put X's down on the, on the seats and that's kind of where they need to sit. Um, so again, hopefully we're able to do that towards the end of the, the end of the football season. But if we do play any games inside, which I'm anticipating, we will um, fans would just have to kind of be outside. So, if the cheerleaders can't yell, I'm assuming the pep band can't play. Yeah, we won't. Again, we have no place for the band to go. No place. Yeah. Yeah, and of course the uh, other people I'm thinking of, because everything will be down on the uh, the turf field, and you're gonna have your visitors up above, probably in like uh, the fence line and the visitors bleachers mm -hmm. of Hughes Stadium looking down. Uh, so the visitors bleachers which would be a great vantage point for fans will most likely be off limits because again, we don't have a press box. Right. So for those of you people that are familiar with football, assistant coaches and you guys go up into the press box. That is probably what we're going to use as our press box so that uh, we've, we've looked that should give about the same vantage point as the press box does. Yes. So that's probably where the assistant coaches with the headsets will be. And so as a result, again, not that we, it's, it's not an anti-fan thing. It's, we right. can't have fans up there just like we don't have fans go to the top of the press box and stand next to the assistant Absol coach. Absolutely. Right. Um, so we'll probably have to put the visiting bleachers. We'll probably have to rope those off as kind of our press box right. uh, as yeah. well. And of course, uh, and we love and Everybody loves the Hopkins and boosters probably not going to be worth them to try to open any kind of concessions. Yeah, no, we wouldn't which, be doing concession stands either. Just given the situation, it, the, um, the risk is not worth the, you know, worth it. Um, yeah. So no, we won't be doing I any just want to make that clear because anyone, you know, loves that hot dog. Everyone loves that <laughs> hot chocolate during a football game. That's most enjoyable. And like during basketball, you didn't have the uh, classes selling there pizza and, and candies and so forth because first off you didn't have that type of crowd right. you were in charge of mission and they didn't have access to that part of the school and so just want people to know that you won't have concessions the boosters uh won't be around i'm sure they'll be around still supporting you but oh uh, absolutely the boosters they're gonna have are great to, they're gonna and have it's to look been at tough. new methods yeah i mean it's been tough for the boosters obviously this year um it's not really a year to to, to to try to raise money, uh, to be perfectly honest, you know, a lot of families are struggling financially, so it's hard to be asking them, you know, for additional money. Um, and, and the typical fundraisers that we do, you know, a lot of it has to do with the banquets, like end of the year banquets. Sometimes they do raffle baskets. We're not having banquets. We can't really have large events that they would typically have. Um, the school store is still functioning, um, but it's using an online Very model. True. So again, it hasn't been probably as lucrative as it's been in the past, but the boosters are always great. Um, and I'm sure they'll be back to kind of normal neck. Well, God, I hope we're all back to normal next year, but <laughs> um, you know, so again, and to your point, Mike, actually concessions are not allowed indoors. That was actually Correct. some of the, the yes. rules and modifications that we had to follow. And again, we only had 24 people in there. <laughs> so, yeah. You know what I mean? It's not really a, <laughs> we're selling concessions, but, um, but it actually wasn't allowed anyway. Correct. Um, and, you know, and that's so. why I want to make that point, just so everyone watching would understand that don't expect the doghouse to be open. Right. And, uh, and here's the other thing. Normally, when we're used to having the fans at Hughes Stadium for football games, um, restrooms. How are you working out the restrooms for the fans? We have the nicest porta potties uh, you can <laughs> imagine. Um. So the, the middle school won't be open again next to Brown. 
Thanks to no, no. So what we'll do for games is we will open those bathrooms um, behind the Doyle gym. And then we also do have porta potties for people that Excellent. don't want to walk. Yep. Uh, again, some of it will come down to, you know, it looks like the snow is going to start to melt here. The weather's beautiful today. But again, it might be easier for people to go into porta potties that are right there versus going all the way up to Doyle, depending on the, sure. the weather conditions. Uh, They're clean well. daily, folks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Rich, They're, very nice. actually... They're very roomy. They're not the tight ones. Yeah. Rich, Kevin, go ahead. Two, two quick ones for you. Mm -hmm. First of all, are you going to have room for us? <laughs> yeah. So we, as we've done you know, across the board, we want to make sure that our, our student athletes are getting the coverage, um, you know, that they deserve. And so we, we've been able to make it work uh, by having local media come in. And, and honestly, the, you know, HCAM, uh, Hopkinton Independent, Metro West, everyone's been great. Uh, one of the things that's been awesome this year is everyone reaches out and says, hey, we're going to come. Is that all right? Yeah. Do you have any protocols? Everyone has been so great communicating. Um, so we'll be able to make that work as, as we have you know, throughout the other seasons. Um, and you guys have done an amazing job covering, you know, not only Hopkinton, but obviously all the surrounding uh, communities and the teams and finding really cool stories to highlight. Um, and certainly this has been a, a year of, of cool stories, to be honest, right? There's yeah. been so many different um, things that have come up that, that have been great to see highlighted in the, in the local news. And uh, do you know if you're going to be going either Friday nights or Saturday days or any idea yet? Yeah, so again, that's a local decision. Um, okay. So we're planning to play our home games for football on Friday nights. Um, I will say our first home game is actually a Saturday, and that's because our first home Friday game is scheduled to be Good Friday. <laughs> um, and so uh, as a school policy, we don't typically play games. Um, so we are playing uh, that Saturday instead, but that's only because of the Good Friday holiday. Um, but then our other two home games will be Friday nights. Um, but I know one of our away games is a Saturday and one is a Friday. So I think some of the schools early on, uh, those first couple of weeks in March, were thinking of playing Saturdays simply because they thought it would be a little warmer yeah. um, than trying to play, you know, on a Friday night in March. Uh, as we know from our typical spring seasons, um, it can be quite cold out there, even for like a 345 game. You know, so if you're playing a seven o'clock football game, it's going to be pretty cold. Um, so I know some schools were moving it to Saturday. We were kind of fortunate that our home games are on the second half of our schedule, just the way it, just the way the schedule worked out. So our home games are all in April, uh, which again is why I think we might have a chance of actually playing in Hughes Stadium. You know, there's no chance of playing in Hughes Stadium on March, you know, March 19th, uh, you know, but maybe April 16th, right? So that, that's a big shift and, and hopefully we can get out there. Yeah, I could tell you from experience, some of those late March, <laughs> early April baseball games, they are cold. Yeah. So hopefully the weather will uh, participate. Well, because we know even even uh, with the uh, the first fall schedule that we start off announcing a game in T-shirts. At the end of the games, we're in pockets and, and snow caps because it, the temperature just changes in a matter of hours. And, and you, you always know, too, when you park your car at the middle school and you walk down to Hughes Stadium, the temperature changes 20 degrees and the wind increases at least 10, 15 miles more an hour. You know, it's right. definitely different. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mike, I was distracted by your little graphics thing going on there. <laughs> oh, yeah, what's going on? Oh, oh, I know what's wrong with that. Uh, <laughs> and that's better. Uh, so I've been hearing, so I do want to talk a little bit about the spring season because mm -hmm. I've heard some rumors. So I want to see what you know so far. Um, is it going to be a full spring season? Uh, and I heard that it could possibly go into late June, early July. Are, are those rumors true? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah they are. So, I mean, so the spring season's delayed, as everybody knows. Uh, so the first day of the spring season will be the 26th, which – you know, you, you, there's different feelings of that because obviously the spring season was totally eliminated last year, right? So there's some mixed feelings about the delayed start to the spring. Um, but I think most people also look at it as a positive because uh, those first few weeks of the spring season are largely conducted indoors, uh, using the gym, using classrooms, um, because we can't get on our baseball, softball fields, you know, things like that. So um, it, it may be in some ways a positive that we're not starting until, until after April break. On the flip side of that, though, to make sure that we have a full season, the season will be extended. So where the, the, the typical uh, end for the regular season is around Memorial Day, 
give or take the sport, right? Sports have different cutoff dates, uh, but usually Memorial Day is roughly the end of the regular season. And then we move into the state tournament in early June. And then the state championships are held in mid-June. Now what you're going to see is that our season will go till mid-June. And then just today, I don't know if anyone saw this. So just today, um, the MIAA's tournament management committee had a meeting to discuss the spring tournament. Um, and there was a motion put forward to have a full state tournament, which would mean sectionals, states, the whole thing, all the way to a state champion. That was voted down. Um, however, they did vote to move forward with a sectional tournament for the spring season, uh, which I think is great. I mean, obviously, it'd be great to have a full a full tournament, um, but I think even a sectional is a step in the right direction. Um, certainly. The spring season, I think everyone has a, a, a little, you know, each season this year has been tough, but at the end of the day, we've had it, right? They've had a chance to play. So I think everyone feels a certain level of, we got to do whatever we can for the spring, right? They've lost their entire season. Now this year is getting delayed. So I'm glad that they're making efforts at the state level um, to allow for some semblance of a state tournament. Um, Obviously, they just voted that today. So there's really no parameters. We have no specifics. And technically, it still needs to go through the COVID task force uh, and the board of directors. But it's definitely a step towards having a sectional tournament. So it's not set in stone, but it's, it's a positive step moving forward. Um, I can't speak for other leagues, but in the TVL, um, we've, we're working on a draft right now of our schedule and trying to make it work. Because the other thing now, by running the season later, we're running into a lot of um, conflicts with graduation and different senior events and schools are trying to get really creative with their senior events. And so most of them are being held outdoors on athletic fields, which is great. Like I have, I'm not complaining about that. I think anything that we can do to give these seniors some sort of senior events is, is worth it. But that also means we can't play games that day. So we're really trying to figure out the schedule but our plan in the TVL is to play a full spring schedule. So what I mean by that is the sports that typically play the large twice and crossover once, you know, that's what we're doing. A sport like track that only plays the large and does, you know, one meet a week, we're doing that. So you will see a more, um, it's going to be condensed. So we're going to be playing a lot of three game weeks um, instead of two game weeks. That'll keep um, us busy. <laughs> uh, to get the schedule in, but uh, we're will. planning to play a full TVL schedule in the spring, which will take us to mid June. And then we would have, you know, for the varsity teams, this sectional tournament, whatever that, you know, turns out to be. So uh, Rich, I, I want to take this chance right now because um, nobody ever really talks about it. And we see it in, you know, knowing you and being involved in the, uh, the sports for a long time. Normally, your staff for these games is consistent of teachers coming in, you know, keeping crowd control, keeping the students under control, you know, or just helping out where things are needed and so forth. Uh, but nobody realized how that has been cut down because of COVID and what is involved in a staff, involved in staffing each and every home game. Now, I want you to take a chance to explain what that staffing is now and, of course, to give a shout-out to your staff who has made this all happen. Please. Yeah, so I, one of the things I would say, Mike, and, and you hit the nail on the head is, you know, some people, you know, we have a lot of people that have worked for us for years in different capacities, whether it be ticket takers, event staff, you know, man, you know managing all the different aspects of games. But with far reduced crowds, we don't need, you know, we don't necessarily need to do that. We're not selling tickets and so forth. Uh, the biggest challenge that we've had this year is finding um, is dealing with the spectator limitations and making sure we're greeting the team. They can't go in a locker room. Everyone needs to be changed. So there's, there's a lot of those pieces, you know, to give you an example in basketball, our building is locked, right? So we had to let in every official, every team, freshman JV and varsity. Uh, we had to let in our 32nd operator, our scoreboard operator, our score book keeper. Um, all of the spectators had to be let in at a certain time. Like, so there was just a lot of those like logistical pieces that were hard for me to certainly do all by myself. So um, the, the person that's helped the most this year has been uh, Corey Mills. Um, 
yeah. who's part of our staff here at the high school. And then he also coaches, um, he coaches wrestling for us. He's actually coaching middle school football for us this fall two season. So he's been a huge, huge help. And we've had some other people that have stepped in as well. We had a great table crew this year, as everyone knows, we had so many different changes and postponements and coach bliss, who, who obviously is a legend. He, you know, he was at most of our games doing the 32nd clock. And then we had, you know, Mr. Connor helping us out. Who's been working our table for years. And we had a teacher, Caitlin Burke do most of our um, book. Um, we've had to use two athletic trainers to cover all the different events. And, and they've worked incredibly hard this year, obviously, to make sure that we're navigating all the medical situations the way we're supposed to. Um, so there's been a lot of pieces to this. Um, teams yeah, aren't yeah, traveling forget, together on buses the- you know we typically have two teams together on a bus we can't do that this year right yeah. so we have one team go they come home next team goes they come home so you know the coaching staff uh, our event staff people have been amazing uh you guys have been amazing yeah. just trying to make this work with the constant changes the constant postponements yeah. um and one of the things that that i, I don't think people realize is You know, for myself, for instance, as an athletic director, I'm around when we have practices, when we have games, but I'm not necessarily like in the gym at every freshman game, at every JV game, because there's so much happening. Because of COVID, we really need to have, it's actually in the rules that you need to have a COVID person (laughs) at every event. Right. So we also had to make a schedule so that there was really not two things going on at once because we needed to have an athletic trainer there. We needed to have either myself or somebody else there. Um, you know, so that's been a challenge to make sure that we, I mean, you guys know on a typical day, we have all sorts of stuff going on all at the same time. Uh, and to yeah. be honest, that's yeah. my biggest concern about the yeah. spring. So, um, so I'm the, really hoping they, they reduce some of these restrictions for the spring season. I don't, to be honest, I don't know how we're going to manage it. Cause as you guys know, we have baseball going on, softball going on, lacrosse going on track going on. You know, we have four levels of baseball. We have three levels of softball. <laughs> you know, I mean? we're, four we're going to have wrestling. <laughs> we're going to have wrestling. We're going to have cheer. Yeah. I mean, we're going to have a million things going on I can't in wait. the spring. There's just, it's not going to be possible for me to be everywhere all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, so we'll have to see how that goes. I think certainly we have an advantage in the spring where most of those sports are outdoors. Um, you know, the weather should be nicer. So I, I think we have some things certainly going in our favor. Numbers are going down statewide. Um, schools right now are obviously trying to get students back in full time. So I think, or I hope, maybe it's a better, a better way of saying it. I hope by the spring, again, we're not going to be normal. You know, I, I think, you know, students are still going to be wearing masks during practices and games. I, I don't think that's going anywhere this spring, but I, I do think we'll be slightly more normal in, in, in terms of how we operate our spring season. Well, I want, I also want you to mention that one last staff member that you left out who sits right in front of you on the other side of the wall. Can't forget her. Uh, Lou is, is amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's the, she obviously doesn't, she never wants any recognition. Um, you know, we, we she put it out there it. on she social that. media. I'm, I'm, she's probably she, going to hate that. I'm, I'm making you mention her name right now. No, not at all. I mean, honestly, I, Lou is like my, the other side of my brain. Um, yeah. you know, she's, she's helping me remember all the different little things that go into it. Um, I, I won't bore everyone with the details, but the amount of nitty gritty stuff that goes on behind the scenes. I mean, you mentioned bathrooms, just like making sure that we have bathrooms uh, you know accessible there's so many little things um and, and lou is just amazing uh for, for those viewers that don't know already we, we you know we've certainly tried to publicize it as best we could but lou um she was selected by masada which is the athletic state athletic directors association uh so she was um selected as the outstanding athletic administrator uh for the entire state um so um that just speaks to obviously her um her devotion, really. I mean, she's so committed. Um, she's emailing me, texting me after hours all the time. She, she goes so above and beyond to make sure that everything is right. She steps in in a moment's notice. Um, you know, she, she, she's amazing. She really is. So uh, we're super fortunate to have her. She helped out a little bit of games as well, but she kind of prefers being behind the scenes uh, right. a lot of the time. We also had days where it was kind of a, a Sanborn family uh, event <laughs> uh, where yeah. Mark was maybe doing one thing for us um mitch uh lou's husband was doing the 30 second clock for us he helped out a lot at our middle school basketball games uh so sometimes we joke that it was a sort of a 
Sanborn family event staff uh, evening. Um, and again, they're just great that, you know, they, they live in town, um, lose kids all game, came through Hopkinton as well. So um, a lot of pride um, in the community and, and making sure that we're doing things the right way. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we're very fortunate here and, and the administrative um, staff that we have here has been super, super supportive of everything that we're trying to do as well. You know, I know in a lot of communities, it's not easy to get sports passed. Uh, you know, our administrative team from, from the high school to the district level uh, has been very supportive of what we're trying to do and, and provide these opportunities in athletics. Well, Rich Hopkinton is uh, certainly uh, lucky to have you as well. You've done a tremendous job working through all the stuff that you've had to work through since you've been here. Uh, I mean, when you first got here, I remember there was the triple E situation, then you get a <laughs> pandemic. So you've done a great job yourself. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. And I do want to mention uh, on HCAM for the fall two season, we will have all the home games, including freshman and JV football. And we'll also have the uh, freshman JV volleyball games as well. And of course the bar city and uh, unified basketball. So we'll pretty much have everything going on uh, sports wise in Hopkinton on HCAM. So we'll certainly uh, happy to cover uh, some spring football <laughs> and other sports. <laughs> But uh, anybody have anything else for Rich before we let him go? Okay. Rich, thanks so much for uh, joining us thanks, Rich. today. We'll certainly have you on again uh, as it gets closer to the spring season. We'll check in with you and get some updates about that. But uh, great job by you and all the staff. And we look forward to uh, fall too. Thank you. And, and again, I, I feel like I, I've said this a few times, but it really – uh, I can't say it enough to thank you guys. I mean, where we are limiting our spectators due to the, you know, the, the COVID guidelines, it, it's been amazing. I, I've heard so many positive compliments, not only from our own community, but from other communities on the job you guys do covering our games. And it's not easy. We've had a lot of games. You guys have changed on a moment's notice. We've had multiple games at different sites and you found ways to cover it uh, beginning in the fall all day Saturday, all day Sunday, uh, and then through the winter, sometimes five nights a week. Um, you guys have been amazing. So I really appreciate this partnership uh, and what you guys have provided so that our community uh, can watch, the, can watch their, their kids play. Um, you know, as a parent myself, I love watching my kids play. So you guys have been so pivotal in, in providing that opportunity for grandparents, aunts, uncles, you name it. Um, so thank you guys very much. And I look forward to uh, continuing this as we, as we finish out this very unusual year. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely well we're looking forward to it and uh hopefully as you said we'll be more normal especially in the spring season uh but we're glad that the kids get an opportunity to get out there and play and we're certainly happy to uh, cover these games so everybody gets an opportunity to watch so thank you guys i'll talk to you guys soon Thank you. a big thank you to athletic director rich cormier for filling us in on all we need to know about the fall two season Right now, let's take a look at the last week of highlights of the winter sports season. The Hillers certainly had some great battles on the basketball courts and the ice. Here's a look. Hopkinton Dover Sherborne girls co-op hockey took on Medway in their final game of the season. Medway netted two first half goals. And now it'll float into Hopkinton territory. And there's a shot and a goal for Medway. How about that? Medway took the win three to nothing, but it was a strong effort by the Hopkinton co-op team against a very strong Medway team. Congratulations on a great season to the players and the first year head coach, Scott Hayes. Hopkinton boys basketball met up with Ashland for their winter season finale. We start off with the JV game. Sam Pantera knocked down several points in the first quarter to help the Hillers to a 16-5 lead. And this is the last game of the season for the boys' teams. Stevens with a nice feed over to Pantera, and Pantera puts it in. Nice early lead for the Hillers. In the second quarter, three different Hillers netted multiple field goals. Up and good wow. is Dessenroth. Looked like a couple hands on that ball when he tried it. Hopkinton led 31 to 20 heading into the third quarter. A 
Hyman feeds it over to Desenroth, who finishes. The Hillers kept hitting well from the field and hung on to take the win in their season finale over Ashland, 61 to 54. Whole different uh, team out here in the second quarter. Hillers are struggling a little bit, but there's a three from Bertucci Bissonette. Good response. In the varsity game, it was a 16 to 13 Ashland lead after a back and forth first quarter. Both these teams for sure. Dalloway for three. No good. Batted up. Pulled down by Barazzini. Here comes Keith. Out to Marazzini. He'll launch the three. Knocks it down. The Hillers offense was unstoppable in the second quarter as they struck for 18 points and took a 31 to 25 lead into the half. Marazzini over to Raheem in the corner for three, knocks it down. In the third quarter, both teams put up 16 points apiece. Feeds it over to Raheem. Now up to Di Pietro, down to the corner. Keefe, yes, swishes it through. He has 14 points this afternoon. Hillers led 47 to 41 heading into the fourth. Kicks it out to Raheem, up for three. Got it! Caleb Raheem with his second three of the game. He has six points. More back and forth in the fourth quarter, but the Hillers hung on to take the win 60 to 56. They finished with three wins and six losses overall. Hillers boys varsity hockey took on Ashland over at Loring Arena. Hillers netted four first half goals. Back to the neutral zone. Set to Ashland territory. Getting there for the clockers is Riva. And now sent out by Mara. Dixon takes a shot. And now out in front of the net, and Carazza pokes it in. Joe Carazza makes it a one to nothing Hillers lead. And Mara trying to clear. Mara flips it over to the neutral zone, and here comes Carazza, and he was looking for a break there. Mara with the backhander, and that's in! The Hillers score a shorthanded goal. Have it, Mara! Joe Carazza nearly had a nice break. Could not get the puck placed like he wanted, but was able to flip it to Mara, and Mara puts it in with 8.56 left to go in the first half. Back and forth we go in Ashland territory. Now up behind the net is Aiden Walsh. He'll send it out. And over to Carazza, and it's gonna be put in! Joe Carazza with another goal. Mara looking for a shot, and it is going to be yet another goal for the Hillers. Hopkinton added two more in the second half. Break up the ice and a good shot there. He is going to be a player to watch over the next couple of years. Sends it over to Mara. Mara. And now Zolotarov will flip it in. Zolotarov ends up with it wide open in front of the net and is able to flip it in to make it 5-1 to one Hillers. For Andrew Moore, he'll take a long shot and wrap that one around. Hillers in the midst of a change. Caleb Dacey back into the game. And Dacey looking for a shot, he pokes it in! Unbelievable! The cut by Milko and Dacey able to poke it in. How about that? The senior comes into the game and gets a beauty of an opportunity to poke it right through the five hole and make it a six to one game. The Hillers took the win six to two. Hopkinton lost a road game to Medfield in their season finale and finishes the season with six wins and three losses overall. We'd like to thank you for watching this edition of HCAM Sports Talk Live. Don't forget, HCAM Sports Talk Live airs every Wednesday at 3 p.m. 
for everyone at HCAM. I'm Tom Nappy. Take care, enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.